Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you for attending and welcome to our home. The um, first, today we're doing this on Thursday. We tried yesterday again in clement weather and thunderstorms. Uh, we had power outages. So we are doing this uh, lecture today on Thursday again, which is uh, unusual. Um, the lecture tonight will be on uh, Tisha B'Av, again, which we'll be celebrating this Sunday. Um, and uh, it's also a secondary uh, a heading would be We the People. So let's begin. We the People. These are the first three letters of the preamble to the Constitution of the United States of America. We the People. Words that can be connected, connected to every Jew in every generation. As God said to the Jewish nation before they were about to enter the land of Canaan, in Deuteronomy, in the portion of in the book of Devarim, in the portion of Etchanan, the verse states, You are a nation consecrated to the Lord your God. The Lord your God chose you to be his special people amongst all the nations on the face of the earth. And we the people, words that apply to all 7.7 .7 billion people that live on this planet today, every individual, created in the image of God Almighty. As it states in the first book of Bereshit in Genesis, that on the sixth day of creation, God created man, B'Tselem Elohim Bara Oto. In the image of God, he created him. So we read in the Torah that all of mankind, all of mankind was created in the image of God, we the people. You know, I'm afraid that somewhere along the way we have lost contact with this concept of we the people. Somehow, the word I seems to have taken its place. I, I find it interesting that the word I is the only letter in the English language that is capitalized in the middle of a sentence. I believe that the loss of this concept of we, the concept of compromise, has been an even greater disaster than this pandemic. Sadly, this pandemic has killed millions of people, but this loss of compromise hmm, may well be that which, God forbid, brings an end to all of our lives. God should help us. We find ourselves in the most affluent of times, the only other time in the history of the world that can be compared to it existed just before God brought the flood. We all know the end of that story. The world was filled with robbery and violence, and God brought the flood and he destroyed his world. You know, the commentaries tell us that before the flood, the earth was so fertile that people planted their fields only once in 40 years. Today, we are living in a time when we should be dancing in the streets instead of rioting. It's almost as if we don't want to even give God a chance to destroy his world again. We are volunteering to do it for him. That light at the end of the tunnel may well be a train that's heading right for us. We are in the three-week period, a time when we remember and mourn the loss of both of our temples. We also have in mind all the other tragedies that have befallen our people throughout the ages. This three-week period ends with Tisha B'Av, the fast of the ninth of the month of Ma'av. This day was chosen by God Almighty as a time of divine retribution. This choice was not an accident. It corresponds with the sin of the spies in the desert. We read in the fifth book of the Torah, in Deuteronomy in the portion of Devar, says Vitaragnu Ba'aleim, that the people complained <clears throat> in their tents. So they complained. <laughs> they had complained many times in the past. What made this complaint so different? The answer is the fact that they complained in their tents. But why does the Torah emphasize this fact when it mentions their sin? Reb Rosenblum said that one reason why it states they complained in their tents was to tell the people that every year for the next 38 years they would be crying in their tents on this same day. Each and every year while they traveled in the desert, on the, ninth, on the night of the ninth day of Av, Moshe would tell all the men between the ages of 20 to 60 who had been sentenced to die in the desert 
that they should go out to the desert and dig their own graves. They would then spend that night sleeping in their graves. In the morning, Moshe would call out, let the living separate from the dead. And each year, some 15,088 men would die. This scenario repeated itself each and every year until all that generation had died out. So their prophecy was correct that this day was and would be a time of their complaining, crying in their tents, not just for the nation while they traveled in the desert, but also for their descendants that would live in the future. I believe that these words, in their tents, helps us to understand as to why this sin was so grievous and why God couldn't forgive them. Their sin was private, not public. Their sin had worked its way into their tents, into their families, and finally, deep within the recesses of their minds. They, much like Adam, first man, had internalized evil. It was now a part of their collective DNA. You know, evil cannot exist in the open, in the brightness of the day. It can only survive in secrecy, in the darkness of the night, in their tents. This evil became like a cancer that had to be surgically removed from the generation as a whole <clears throat> me, in order for it to survive. All the men of that generation between the ages of 20 to 60 had to die in the desert. This was an attempt by God to remove the evil that had infected the older generation before it infected their children, before it became genetic. So their children were then placed on a 38-year program, a, a, a treatment of sorts that consisted of the diet of the mon, spiritual food, and the therapeutic waters of the well of Miriam. This diet may have helped to diminish the influential force of the evil that they had internalized, but it could not eradicate that evil completely. The question that we may ask is, do we really believe that evil traits are genetic and that they can be passed on to family members from one generation to the next. You know, we know the Torah was given to us on Mount Sinai. However, the mountain is referred to with five different names altogether. One of those names is Chorev, which can also be pronounced the same letters as Cherev, which in Hebrew means sword. You know, there's a medrash that states that the book alluding to the Torah and the sword, alluding to Asa, came down to the world together. The way to be saved by one is by attaching oneself to the other. The Hebrew word chorev, which is spelled chet, resh, vet, is also an acronym for the three character traits that define a Jew. They are chesed, kindness, rachamim, mercy, and busha, modesty. The Talmud tells us that if a Jew does not possess these three traits, then it is an indication that they are descended from the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude, those Egyptian hierarchy, that Moshe took out with the Jewish nation when they were redeemed from Egypt, hereditary traits. We read in the Torah in the portion of Shalach that before Moshe sent Yahushua on his mission as one of the twelve spies, those 12 illustrious individuals who were chosen to represent each one of their respective tribes. Their mission was to bring back a report about the land. Now, before they embarked on their journey, Moshe first added a letter to Yoshua's name. He added the Hebrew letter Yud, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. By doing so, he changed his name from Hoshea to Yehoshua. Now, the letter Yud is the letter that we associate with God's creation of the world above. The reason why Moshe added this letter to his name, rather than any other, was to serve as a sort of protective shield against the evil plans of the other ten spies. As it states in the verse in the fourth book, the book of Bamidbar, in the Torah, in the portion of Shalach, Rashi on this verse comments that the Hispalel Alav, and that he, Moshe, prayed for him. Rashi, quoting the Talmud in Sota, adds Moshe's prayer, which is, May God deliver you from the counsel 
of the spies. Yeshua's grandfather, who was Yosef, was guilty of speaking lush and hara, evil reports about his brothers. Moshe was then concerned that the same trait of lush and hara may well have been inherited by his descendant, Hosea. Moshe thought that he might therefore be easily convinced to join with the spies in their plan to speak evil about the land, hereditary traits. We also see with the story of Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, when he was lying on his deathbed. He wanted to bless Yosef's two sons, his grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh, before he died. In the book of Genesis, in the book of Bereshit, in the portion of Ayachi, Rashi there tells us that Yaakov wanted to bless his grandsons, but the Shekhinah, the divinity of God's presence, departed from him. Rashi continues and says that the Shekhinah left him because of the evil people that were destined to descend from his two grandsons. Yaakov was afraid that these traits were genetic and that they could be traced back to his grandsons, hereditary traits. So after Yosef's passionate plea to his father, the verse then says that Yaakov says to him the Hebrew words, Koche Malai, please bring them to me. The Shem Yishmuel says that the word Kochem always means to lift. But could Yaakov actually physically lift his two grandsons? Instead, this statement refers to a metaphorical lifting. He lifted them above those evil descendants that threatened to pollute the character traits of each member of their tribes. So again, we see a concern about evil traits being inherited by future generations, hereditary traits. So as we look around at the Jewish world today, what do we see? It has nothing to do with being religious or not. You know, that when you meet people, they don't ask you, what is your affiliation? Or, or did you put on filling this morning? And then they hate you accordingly? A Jew is a Jew. You know, it didn't seem to make much of a difference to Hitler, Yamak Shemo. He went back three generations. There were Jews in the concentration camps, <clears throat> those that had converted to Catholicism, some of whom had even become Catholic priests. There seems to be no distinction when it comes to anti-Semitism. Whether we like it or not, we were chosen. As the verse says in the Isaiah chapter 42, that we were chosen to be a light unto the nations. Uh, what I find interesting is that if we are to be a light unto the nations, well, then the nations seem to be the primary focus and purpose of our existence. After all, if there are no nations, then there would be no need for any light. Ergo, the Jewish nation. But before we can be a light unto the nations, we first need to be certain that our lights are burning strong and bright. Even though each one of us is only a candle, still, one candle can eat up a lot of darkness. It is our duty, our responsibility, to use our candle to kindle as many other candles as possible throughout our lifetimes. You know, the beauty of lighting other candles is that it does not diminish your light in the least. However, the combined illumination of all of our flames together creates a bonfire, one that reaches straight up to the heavenly throne above. You know, when the Torah tells us about the making of the ark and the tabernacle, it states in the second book of the Torah in Shemot, in Exodus, in the portion of Truma, that the ark must be covered with gold, mibayat u michut, inside and out. What does this warning, inside and out, teach us? Now, the ark was made up of three boxes, one inside the other. Both the outside and inside boxes were made out of pure gold, and the middle box was made out of cedar wood. You know, this wording is teaching us a deep and important lesson. Many times, people are careful about the outside, that which other people, the public, can see. However, they are lax about what goes on behind closed doors on the inside, that which out, which is out of the public's view. So the Torah is telling us that even though the inside box that made up the ark would not be seen still, 
it required the same attention to detail and dimensions as did the outside box. In addition, it had to be made out of the same pure gold as was the outside box. This serves as an allusion to us that we too need to observe the same level of religiosity whether we are in the privacy of our own home or whether we are out amongst the public. We always need to remember that wherever we are, whatever we do, we are always in the presence of our Father in Heaven, God Almighty. So this Sunday, we will be observing the fast of the ninth day of the month of Av. It is a day that we all need to reflect. This has been a difficult year. We have been forced to experience many tests and revelations. The truth is that we really still don't know what the end of this period of time will be. But one thing is certain. We need to know that we, as Jews, both on a personal level and on a national level, and regardless of our affiliations, need to be a light unto the nations, each one of us, in our own special and unique way, must try to make ourselves and the world around us just a little better than it was before this pandemic struck. Look around you. Open your eyes. Open your ears. Stop, look, and listen. God is trying to tell us all something. Financial worries, world chaos, social disobedience, buildings collapsing, families that can no longer talk civilly to each other, lifelong friendships destroyed. The list goes on and on, and it seems as if it's growing daily. There seems to be a sense of total despair in the world. We all need to look and see that we, each one of us, tries to change, tries to grow, tries to help make this beautiful world that God Almighty has blessed us with the paradise that it was meant to be. Each one of us needs to accept our own unique mission in life and work on making ourselves and the world the best that we can be. You know, the first word in the Ten Commandments is the Hebrew word anochi, which means I. The last word of the Ten Commandments is the Hebrew word reyacha, which means your friend. You know, we may begin our journey in life as self-centered individuals, thinking only about the I, ourselves, much like a little child, mine, mine. However, let us hope that we can reach the truest level of joy, where we can come to the realization that it is better to be a giver and not a taker, where we grow and mature. Now, this can only happen when we concentrate all of our energies on putting aside the I and focusing on the we, we, the people. There's a story told of Napoleon Bonaparte that once he was riding past a synagogue on Tisha B'Av on the ninth day of the month of Av, and he heard sounds of wailing coming from the synagogue. Curious, he sent one of his officers to inquire as to what the Jews were crying about. The officer returned and told Napoleon that the Jews were mourning about the loss of their temple. He asked the officer, well, when was their temple destroyed? The officer replied, some 2,000 years ago. Hmm. Napoleon then said, this is a nation destined for greatness. So let us fast and pray to God Almighty, our Father in Heaven, that this year will be the last time that we are compelled to fast on the ninth day of all. Not because we have managed to self-destruct, but rather because we have finally managed to overcome all of our differences and have come together in a spirit of peace and harmony. Rav tells us that Shabbos is the true giver. If Rosh Chodesh, the time when we bless the new month, were to fall out on the Shabbat, well, the Shabbat would give up the Maftir, the Haftorah, and even the Musaf prayer. If Yom Tov, the holiday were to fall out on the Shabbat. Then it would give up all the prayers in addition to the Maftir and the Haftorah. It would even give up the portion that we read from the Torah. But if Yom, pardon me, and if Yom Kippur were to fall out on the Shabbat, Shabbat would give up everything, even the food that we eat. But if Tisha B'Av, the ninth day above, falls out on the Shabbat, 
the Shabbat gives up nothing, and the fast is postponed until Sunday, which is what we will be observing this year. So let us pray to God Almighty and say that if he can push off the fast for one day, then he can certainly push it off forever. So let us strive to make this world a better place for all of God's creations. And with that, let us help to usher in the coming of Mashiach to Canaan quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for listening. Again, again, God should bless you and yours with all that's good. You should be happy, healthy, and safe. Hopefully, again, you will be able to fast on this Sunday. And let's hope and pray that, again, it will be the last fast. And with that, we should bring Mashiach. Again, thank you. And good Shabbat.